Good afternoon here in Right, thanks, Afrik. Thank you so much. Yeah, and you're off. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, good, this is a good afternoon here in Dubai as well. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me, uh, Chatwik, as well as uh, uh, Biju, uh, Matthew, and uh, Kavita. It's good to be here. It's good to be connected with uh, and focus students who want to spread financial literacy. Who want to learn about gold, um, which is what I am quite involved in. So without much ado, let me jump to the next slide and um, start with an interesting story. Next slide, please. So I'll start from my journey because I think stories are quite compelling. And uh, just halt it there, Satvik, uh, one, one point at a time, yeah? Just stop there, thank you. So the first point is quite clear, right? Mediocre Peacock. Uh, this is where we start my story, right? So in case you thought I was a superstar right from day one, I wasn't. And that's lesson number one. You don't need to have a great past to have a great future. So I didn't study much. I didn't go to college. I skipped class. And of course, inevitably, you get what you work for. And I got a second class degree. In sharp contrast to my colleagues or fellow students who got first class degrees, right? Now that is humiliating, right? As you can imagine. Next point, please. So CA. Uh, but before CA, a couple of failures in CAT or MBA. Again, you study much. You didn't have any guidance, no vision, right? And this is one very important point about career. You need mentors along the way. But someone said, try CA. I tried CA. I loved it. A lot of diligence, a lot of focus required. It was a mix of accounting, tax, audit, a bit of finance as well. And that was a moment of redemption, sort of which cleaned up my BCom mess in degree, right? Because I nailed CA in the first attempt. And you can say in terms of confidence, I never looked back. And in terms of career, you need that. You need that initial boost whether in college, ideally, or sometimes even later, like to a CA or a CFA course, right? Next one, please. And then, of course, I worked in Kerala for Industrial Bank. Uh, that was probably the best period of my career in, at that time, right? Because there's huge learning curve uh, in terms of, I wasn't in accounting, I was actually at a loan office of uh, appraising projects. That was fun. Three years, learned a lot. Worked with very senior IAS officers. Uh, worked with um, what do you call secretary level people. Worked with ministers even, which, as you can imagine, for a 25 year old was a great thing and gave me a lot of confidence. Right. Next point. And of course, then spent about five years in audit with, with KPMG, with uh, with Ada Anderson, with Ernst Young, uh, Caroline in Oman and Dubai. Now, audit was there because, you know, it's a great opportunity to great break into the big four. Um, I learned a lot about analysis, about due diligence, about being structured, about time management. A lot of important parts, you know, uh, about focusing on the goals, on the key objectives of audit. Did quite a few valuation assignments as well. And then after five years, you know, you think that's enough, right? You've spent five years in big four. And beyond that, um, it's difficult, right? To rise to director, principal partner. And I don't really fancy myself there. So I moved on to industry. Next point. Satrik, next point, please. Yeah. So this was an interesting period. Four years as a director of real estate development company. If you've heard of the Palm Islands in Dubai, it's a government company, massive multi-billion dollar projects. Worked with some of the best engineers in the world, the best architects on earth. Um, learned a lot about engineering, project management, and real estate finance, about valuation. Um, Joined as manager, got double promotion, became director of their largest project, uh, head of corporate finance department, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, next point, at some point I felt, you know what, uh, CA is not enough probably. CA is Indian qualification, not widely recognized. So I decided to do my CFA, right? And I love the journey. So much learning, so many things new. And what's fantastic is once you're a chartered accountant, then CFA becomes easier because you're, you're, you're Basics in accounting, um, corporate finance are super solid, should be super solid. So it was a great international qualification. There's a lot of new learning, management, management, etc. Um, I had time on my hands and uh, and I was applying it at work because I was effectively looking after cash flows and feasibility studies, right? The property company that I was in. Next one. And then, of course, spent some time in listed asset manager as a speed director. By that time, I'd spent about, what, 17 years in corporate life. And you think, you know, uh, you're 40 now, 
you've spent enough time, built a network, built a reputation, learned a lot, but then it gets to a point where you feel, what next? CFO, uh, CEO, CIO, uh, I didn't fancy myself there because I thought I was not making an impact. I thought there was lack of autonomy. I thought there was much more to life than earning a big fat paycheck and having a call of office and having an executive assistant, right? So I quit corporate life in 2009, next point, and started my own company, which was actually in training. Um, and fast forward, a uh, very interesting journey, which we can talk about at some later uh, platform. Next point. Uh, there were three of us. We co-founded the company. I ran the company. I was teaching CFA and a lot of other programs as well throughout the GCC. We became the biggest, um, one of the biggest financial training companies in the region. Uh, we sort of became very attractive to a US multinational called Kaplan. You probably heard the name, massive in GMAT and medicine and engineering and publishing and things like that, right? So they bought the company in 2017. So it's an interesting story, right? Uh, of my, where you start from uh, PCOM, then chart account C, uh, audit, uh, consulting, move on to industrial life, uh, you know, entre- become, become an entrepreneur after that, become a trainer as well, and then uh, sell the company. And now uh, acting as a volunteer, as a podcaster, as a mentor, uh, as a speaker, etc. Et so now what's all planned, it wasn't planned, right? Uh, I was, maybe each segment was planned, CA was planned, CFA was planned. So you can't really plan your career for that long. You grab opportunities that come along, um, look at what you like, what you don't like, what suits your strengths, what doesn't work as far as your weaknesses are concerned. So that's what I think from a career perspective, my key takeaways would be. Next slide, please. Right, so let's talk about, uh, you can can show everything, right, Safik, yeah? So let's talk about finance because that is a very important point. Why the finance investment club, right? Uh, We'll come to that part later. But I think let's start from a high level picture. Why finance? But I think finance has a big, um, uh, what do you call, is a big advantage for society. It's a big benefit for society because it attacks financial illiteracy, right? Um, you can uncover accounting frauds through finance. You can actually blow apart companies and you're really good at FRA financial reporting to do that. You can actually invest in impactful projects, right? In terms of sustainability, in terms of uh, what you call water or, or, or to, what you call uh, waste management, things like that. You can raise money for worthy causes because you know how it works. You know the UNPBs, you know your IRRs, right? You know how to, how to prepare an offer circular. And you can even turn around a worthy entity, uh, a company which actually means a lot to society, which is probably going down because of mismanagement or whatever. You can turn around because you know finance, right? Now on the right side, what is it for you? Why should you learn finance, right? So you can apply analytical and communication skills. I thought one of my biggest strengths, or probably my biggest strengths, uh, are these two. Uh, analysis, uh, financial analysis, valuations, um, and communication. So you analyze and you communicate, to put it very uh, crudely, right? Can you show all the points, Sarpik, please? And then for finance, we talk about some carriers in finance, but it's vast, right? We talk about commercial banking, investment banking, insurance, we talk about risk management, you name it. You have your choice there, it depends on what you want to do. And what you can do then of course if you're really respected in your in your career you also become a trusted advisor to ceos the company's work or cios and to clients and that's that's a very good place to be because they look up they look up to you for advice they rely on you because you're an expert and then of course you manage the finances right i mean uh if you know how to invest and if you learned how to invest then why don't you apply it in your own portfolio why don't you educate yourself about how can you increase your wealth by, by basically applying what you learned, right? And of course, entrepreneurship. Like in my case, I was, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, a chartered accountant who worked in a big four and then in industry and then jumped to entrepreneurship. But I could do that because of my accounting background, because of my finance knowledge. Because when, you, when you're teaching finance, obviously, the CA and CFA helps. When you're running your own company, I mean, you're selling your company as well, that knowledge is absolutely invaluable. Right. So finance is a definitely a force for good. I think over the last decade or so, it's got a bad rep because of the financial crisis, because of what bankers did, because of Wall Street, because of <clears throat> sorry toxic debt. But let's not forget the fact that ultimately it can actually uh, have an impact both the society level and at the personal level. Next slide, please, Sadhvi. Right. So. What I want to talk about here is why FIC, right? Can you show the entire points, please? So the reality, and we know this, right? And, and, and you should know this. The reality is employers want uh, employable staff. 
they rarely tra- train you on basics. They don't have time for that. Many recruits, many fresh graduates I've seen, I've, I've, I've hired some, of, I've interviewed them, I've taught them, right? They're basically unemployable because of two things, attitude gap and aptitude gap. And of course, we all know that a lot of what you study in university, while helpful, while relevant, is simply not sufficient to bridge the gap to be an effective employee at work. So why I love the concept of FIC and why when Satvik reached out to me, I said, yes, definitely. Let me go. Because what you're effectively doing or will do is you're learning by doing. You start early as well, right? Rather than learning by doing at work, you're learning by doing at uni. You're learning two things, right? Broadly, you're learning basically skills. What skills? Modeling, valuation, writing, record economics. You're also learning, by the way, whether you realize it or not, quite a few interesting life skills that go far beyond uh, research reports and consulting. You're learning about planning, teamwork, delegation, how to be accountable, how to deal with failure when you make bad investments, how do you survive, how, how resilient are you? And very importantly, something that everyone forgets and everyone overlooks uh, because everyone's focused on IQ, you also learn a lot about yourself, uh, how to manage your emotions or what they call EQ. So I think from that point, FIC uh, ticks many boxes and I would urge all the members uh, to basically focus on the on the both the attitude side and the aptitude side because there's a lot you can learn. Next slide, please. So investment banking, right? Let's talk about, I mean, briefly talk about the various uh, pros and cons. So whenever you think about finance, the first thing that comes to mind is IB. You want to work with Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, blah, blah, blah. So can you show both, right? So I think pros and cons. So you have the pros and cons of investment bank. Now, I don't want to read it out to you. These are self-evident. Uh, the reason I put this out here is because people normally only see the pros, the first points. But I think before you jump into any job, career, you need to know what exactly lies ahead. So typically what happens when you go for interview is, uh, I mean, you get a job, you're only aware of three or four things. The title, the, the responsibilities, the salary, and maybe a couple of other things. You're not told and you're not aware of what are the downsides what are the hidden opportunities? What are the minefields that you must not tread on? So I think IB is a classic example of that, right? You learn a lot on IB, right? But to communicate, you make money, you learn how to deal with pressure, and it gives you some good client connections. But what are the cons of working in IB, right? It can be very boring, can be very torrid, very grueling. Um, job security can be very low. And some workplaces, not all, can be very toxic. It may not be up for you. That's investment banking for you in a snapshot of that, right? Very big sector in the world. Next slide, please, Sathit. Another sector you look at basically, especially if you're studying or looking for CFA, is investment management, right? Which is basically asset management, portfolio management, um, covers research, bond research, stock research, whatever it is, right? Again, you have pros and cons, right? It's, yeah, you can make some money. It's very technical, more technical than IB. There's a lot of growth, it's less stressful. You have less hours compared to IB, right? But again, the cons are there. So the cons there, by the way, and Satvik sort of, sort of mentioned that earlier about research, uh, in a way, uh, is that automation is taking over, right? Um, you have uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning gradually coming into uh, all these areas. So basically, you need, to, you need to learn how to use software. You need to learn how to use Python, for example, or SAS. Um, passive investing is becoming big. What's passive investing? Because active managers are failing to perform and can't generate enough alpha what Hathik mentioned earlier, basically there's trillions of dollars pouring into uh, exchange traded funds and index funds. And that means, you know what, uh, they don't need fund managers, they don't need analysts anymore. You have market risk, which is of course what you, what you, what you call about uh, volatility in the market because of geopolitical events, because of financial crisis, because of COVID, whatever it is. And of course, you don't make as much money than IIB. You know, it's almost like, you know, more risk, more return, less risk, less return. But there are pros and cons. There's nothing like a perfect job um, or a perfect career. Right. So is it only IB and is it only investment management that you can go and look at? No. So there are other options that we have in finance as well, right? Next slide, please. So I would urge you to look at areas beyond these two areas, right? This is what you normally hear of. For example, is corporate treasury. There's consulting. There is credit risk management in banks. There is a very fascinating uh, and very rewarding career of actuarial science. It's a very tough exam. Many people will pass that, but the pay is pretty good and it's quite mathematical and scientific. As well. You have corporate finance where you look up, you go to the company that I did, and you evaluate projects, you help raise money for the project. 
And there's project finance, which is in banks, for example, or big financial institutions, where basically evaluate multi-billion dollar projects, um, tie up with other banks, fund a massive project. Or you can even become a financial journalist, right? Quite a few CFO charter holders and CH charter accounts are financial journalists. They work for top newspapers and magazines and journals and, and, and they investigate and they write fantastic articles in them. So careers are far more than just, you know, uh, working in Goldman Sachs or, you know, uh, uh, working in, in, in an asset manager or, or, or a mutual fund. Next slide, please. So which brings me to the next point, right? Very important point. How do you know what is for you? And that is one thing that, you know, people take a long time to discover. What is the sweet spot? You've probably seen this icon before, right? Or this image, uh, which pretty much shows the Japanese concept of Ikigai, which is uh, the sweet spot where the four things, your passion, what you would like to do, your your mission, the, what the world needs, your vacation, what, what you can be paid for, and your profession, what you're good at. They intersect. Now, this is a great graphic. It's a great theory. It works rarely early in life. So what happens is, let's take one by one quickly, right? Now, passion keeps changing. Today's passion is not next year's passion. So what do you know about that? Well, you've got to work at it, right? You've got to keep on working on different jobs. Bro. What are you good at? Profession? Well, that's easier than uh, that you can think of because you know what your skills are, right? So I knew earlier on my skills were analysis and communication. Not that difficult to figure out. What you can be paid for? Now, is there's no point being passionate about something and being very good at it, you don't get paid for it and paid well. So that's something you got to look for. So look around you, see what are the well-paying jobs. And finally, mission. Now, mission is, you might think it's a bit of a, what you call luxury, something like self-actualization in Maslow's hierarchy. But when you reach a certain age, or maybe even at your age now, I feel that, you know what? I need something more than just a fancy title and a great paycheck. I want to make an impact. So how do you find the sweet spot, right? is also very important. Can you, next slide please. And is, so how do you find that now? I've, I've also done a executive coaching program. And by the way, this link on my website takes you to a very interesting blog I wrote last year on how to find your career, uh, your, your ideal career, right? The four factor career theory they call it. So try that out. Uh, next slide please, I think. Now the point comes to, okay, how do you know yourself? Because so so you think this is your passion, you think this is what you're good at, but then there has to be a structured way of doing it. So there's this interesting psychometric test called the Big Five test. Now the Big Five test, what it does is basically it basically ranks you or evaluates you on five criteria: uh, openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and erotism. Now, why is it so important as far as careers are concerned, especially careers in finance? I'll tell you why. I take a very simple example. Right? Now, investment banking, I already told you, requires a very high level of resilience, um, long working hours, and working in difficult environments, right? That means your consciousness has to be very high and your neurotism must be low. You must be calm. Now, if you don't meet these boxes or if you can't be, uh, you know, low or high, as I mentioned earlier, in these five parameters, you're going to find it miserable to work in investment banking, as an example. So you should know yourself. So, and there's a self-assessment tool. It's called Find My Why, www.findmywhy.com. Try that. This is some very interesting reports that you can evaluate yourself, find what you're good at and where you will shine and where you'll be uh, not so good at. Do that and you'll find yourself, uh, you know, you'll find more about yourself, you know, more about you. Right. Next slide, please. So we come to the secret sauce, which is really quite straightforward, right? Probably the tries of Joe of Jordan Peterson, right? famous uh, Professor Jordan Peterson from the University of Toronto in Canada. Now, he's of course written a lot, he's spoken a lot, the YouTube videos of him online. Now, he basically said, What? Of course, you need two things to succeed, obviously, right? IQ is one, and hard work, or what you call consciousness, is the second one. But within that, there's something called industriousness, which is basically what is it's not just enough to be uh, orderly, you have to be industrious, basically. You have to work diligently in a focused way. Now, that also, just like IQ, has a strong genetic component, like everything else in life. They will have a behavior trait in life, right? Like seeing humans. But if you set up micro habits, if you have a structured plan, like a daily routine that I follow, for example, that I mentioned on LinkedIn quite frequently, you can get there easily. That's not, there's not like, you know, uh, it's not like um, something that you have or you don't have. 
So that is basically what you call it in a nutshell, what you require to survive uh, in, in a corporate career, right? Next slide, please. So what I've done also in the last uh, one year, and which uh, I think Ritu mentioned in the section, is because I saw these gaps in employability, I saw these gaps in work readiness where thousands, well, millions of people are graduating annually, but they are very naive about what the job requires and what careers mean and what are the implications. So I said, Lord, let me start a podcast. So the Real Fans Mentor podcast started with that idea and continues with that theme in mind, where I interview on a monthly basis somebody that I find interesting and who has gone through a transformational journey. So for example, this lady that I've, I've interviewed and who, whose podcast will go live, episode will go live in a few days, she did a BCom, went to UK, did a master's there from Cass Business School, then quit all that after working in JP Morgan for two years, investment banking, corner office, great job. Quit all that, came back to India, and now is teaching. And coincidentally, what she's doing is financial literacy. So which also you know, syncs with the message of FIC. So people like that, that I want to talk to, that I want to spread their message, right? And so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. A lot of us at our age, you know, 40s, 50s, we have gone through trial and error because we didn't have mentors uh, and we wish we had mentors early on to tell us what not to do and what to do. Uh, you have the benefit of podcasts, YouTube, internet, uh, all those things, and this is a great way of learning. So I think you should go to the I mean go to the website. Um, it's called www.realfinancemanager.com, therealfinancemanager.com, and you'll find uh, this is the 19th episode. You'll find lots of blogs and book reviews and a lot of other interesting stuff as well. It's all free. Um, because I wanted to access to everyone else as far, as far as possible, right? Next slide, please. And um, with that, uh, we come to the end of the session. I hope I'm not over time. We have, I think, about uh, five minutes, right, Sathvik, for the Q&A. And I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone might have. Yes, sir. It's, it's five minutes. Yeah. Anyone has any questions? Feel free. Don't be shy. Uh, sir, I believe there are a few questions on the... Yeah. So yeah, I think, Aditya, okay. I just, uh, so for a career in finance, which according to you is a better option than MBA or CFA? I think uh, the right question would be to ask yourself would be what career do I want first? And then you work backwards and look at the qualification, right? So very quickly, CFA is for investment management. You want to get into portfolio management, research, bond research, stock research, valuations, um, private wealth management, wealth advisory, that's CFA. It's technical. It's a practitioner's qualification, right? You are, you are bound to a strict code of ethics, etc. Et if you want to be uh, in investment banking, um, if you want to sort of have a much more wider scope, if you want to get immediate placements after you finish, if you want a particular brand on your CV, uh, if you want to build a network among alumni, for example, then MBA is probably a better bet, especially if you go to a top school, right? Not one of the top schools in India or overseas. Because there, you will get all what I mentioned. You will get great learning. You meet some fantastic alumni and uh, professors. You will have a brand on your CV. Uh, there will probably be some great campus placements at the end of the course. Uh, and uh, you can enter uh, investment banking, for example. Because with CFA, investment banking is a very long shot. MBA or a master's, you have a better chance. I hope that answers your question. So Sattvik has a question, right? How do you think we can integrate? So you see that question, Sattvik. I would like to say that there are people who are privately messaging and I would be putting it across uh, in public. Ah, okay, sorry. Sure. So do you want to ask me the question, Sattvik? Because I can't see all the questions. Can you ask me the questions on, uh, if you don't mind? Thank you. I can't hear you, Sattvik. I think you're on mute. Yes. Uh, so, there's a question, um, it says, how do you think we can integrate finance, which is up to industry standard, in our former curriculum? I think uh, that's something for the university, of course, and college authorities to decide. But one good way of doing it is, if you look at the CFA curriculum, and I'm not, I may be a bit biased here because I'm a CFA charter. Right? 
do the CFA curriculum, it's actually very practitioner oriented. Level one is foundation, level two is valuation, level three is portfolio management, good behavioral finance, risk management, etc. Now, a lot of universities around the world have incorporated a significant part of the CFA curriculum in their um, BCom in accounting or BCom in finance, for example, specialization. That's an excellent way of, you know, not reinventing the wheel. It's already there. It's a brilliant curriculum in tested for the last 70 years. Has updated every year almost across all levels. Uh, incorporate that, become what they call it. I think they call it the program partner of CFA Institute. So a lot of universities opt for that. CFA Institute work closely with the universities and helps them integrate the CFA curriculum as far as possible. I think the minimum is about 70% of the CFA curriculum must be integrated in the university curriculum. Uh, and that's one great way of, you know, uh, and, and the other advantage of that obviously is you can do your CFA easier, right? Because you've already been through a lot of the curriculum. CFA level one at least becomes quite easy for you and, and probably even two and three. The second way you can make um, university more practical is exactly what you guys are doing, right? The FIC, which is why I said, you know, um, I like the idea a lot because we're looking at research, consultancy, valuations, um, advisory. We're pretty much doing what a lot of uh, employees uh, expect from a finance graduate when he grows within the firm. So I think that's two two ways I can think of top of my head how which you can sort of integrate finance into your the realistic side of finance into your career. Good afternoon, sir. Yeah, good afternoon. So we have another question uh, coming in sure. back our message. So Shoot. oh so you, you have been in so many uh, diverse careers, and right. uh, as you said in your presentation, there are so many diverse aspects to working in finance. So what do you think some of the some of the things that people should keep in mind are when it comes to transitioning between say from investment banking to investment management or from any finance career in general to a different one? Yeah, good question, right? Transitioning. I, I get asked this question quite often, by the way. Um, first of all, transitioning works when you're younger. Companies basically do not uh, have a very broad mind in accommodating transition late in your career. So when I say younger, I mean, you know, before 30, for example, ideally 27, 28, by which time you've worked enough, you've worked long enough to know what you're good at and what you want to do, right? Whether it is insurance or banking or investment management or IV. Uh, so transitioning is easier then. So for example, I know examples of, you know, an engineer who transitioned to investment banking. Quite a few examples of that, right? After getting a master's. So, that's, so that helps in transition. So first point is transition as, as early as possible. Don't delay your transition. Number two, sometimes transition requires you to invest some time and money, like getting an MBA or a master's to give you that jump. Otherwise, you're nowhere, right? Especially investing in banking, but right? MBA is almost essential, right? Some transitions are easier, some transitions are difficult. Right? So, for example, transitioning from the big four, work as an auditor, to um, what you call a finance manager in a client is very easy. Okay? But transitioning the same big four from audit to consulting is very difficult because consulting it requires some different skill sets. So transitioning depends a lot on your age, depends a lot on the opportunities available, um, and depends a lot on the, the skills that you've developed and the qualifications that you have at that time, to put it very broadly. I hope that makes some sense. Yes, sir. And I would like to mention that there are very specific questions on um, stock trading, corporate finance. Two things right. I would like to mention. Uh, one is we will be having sessions on corporate finance, consulting, stock trading, specifically on that in the future in FIC. And uh, two, uh, so would you be willing to take specific questions on uh, subjects? Uh, sure. Let me see what the specific questions are. Let's get, let me get a flavor. Um, Okay, sir. I, I would, uh, yeah. First, one question is which certification is best suited for career in corporate finance? So, corporate finance is quite a, way, with a vague term, right? So, corporate finance, I'm as, I, as in he means or she means working in a company in finance. Uh, if that's the case, then um, HR accountancy would be helpful because you look at financial statements, right? It's not essential, but it's helpful. Uh, or ICMA or a CIMA, you know, Charter Institute of Management Accountants uh, qualification. Any qualification in financial accounting or management accounting is very useful when you're planning to work in corporate finance. Now, if you're working in India, Charter Accountant, CA makes sense. If you plan to work overseas, CIMA, 
for example, um, for CGMA from that American uh, AICP Institute makes sense. So you pick your qualification based on, of course, where you want to go to, but also maybe which part of the world you want to work in. If you're going to immigrate to Canada or Australia, look at the qualifications that are recognized there, those markets, right? So it depends on jurisdictions as well. But yeah, a, a, a chartered accountancy or a professional accounting qualification is a fantastic foundation to start a qualification, to start a, sorry, start a career in corporate finance. So we have some more questions uh, yes, on the same, uh, same vein. So now we have a question. Is there scope for FRM in the future? It looks quite interesting. I have developed an interest for it, but wanted to hear something from a mentor like this. Okay, I'm, I'm going to be very blunt about this, right? Uh, I have to be. I don't want to mislead anyone. So FRM is uh, obviously is a financial risk manager qualification. It's, it's, it's a two-part qualification. It's um, first part is foundation. Second part is very specialized, focusing on banking uh, industry. It, it's a good curriculum. It's a tough exam. Now, the problem with FRM is that um, it is not as well recognized or as well respected as some other qualifications like CFA. Um, partly also because the body that promotes FRM has, in my opinion, not done enough to promote the qualification in emerging markets. They're, they're basically big in the US and North America and UK, right? So it's a niche qualification that uh, has lagged behind. Um, to be honest, if you go to a bank and say, I have an FRM qualification, can you hire me in risk management? It is not going to do the trick a lot of the time. Whereas if you have a CFA and go to somebody and say, I want to work in investment management or stock research, they might look at you seriously. You know what I mean? Um, so that's that's my take on FRM. So a lot of people, by the way, they do their you know, uh, BCom, then do the CFA and FRM. You know? In India, we have this uh, tendency of accumulating badges, you know, do BCom, MBA, CFA, FRM, uh, CPA, CIA, I mean, and you go on, right? Uh, so people accumulate it. Now, does it really result in their them making some significant career shift? I don't know. I, 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 I doubt it. Uh, it doesn't give you as much of a boost as a CA or a CFA would do. I'm not saying it because I have those qualifications. FRM is far more niche qualification. Risk management is a very tiny area overall was compared to, say, financial accounting or asset management. Uh, thank you, sir. We'll take uh, two more questions that we have sure. already got sure. and uh, we'll close off the Q&A session. So one sure. uh, question is, is an MIM worth it or should we wait a few years to go for an MBA itself considering how MIM gives us an earlier breakthrough but is not recognized worldwide? Sorry, uh, what is MIM? Sorry, what is MIM? I shouldn't, I can't hear you. Yeah, it's a ma Masters in Management. So the question is management. Okay, I haven't, I haven't, okay, I haven't heard that qualification. Is that is that from Christ University? No, I assume it's about a general degree, as in MIM the degree and MBA the degree. Right. Okay, so I think you mentioned it before as well, Ashwin. Right, MBAs. Uh, well, a lot of people in India do MBAs right after college. Right, you go engineering or you become and then do an MBA. Right, from IIMs or whatever. That's become a practice. I personally think that doing a master's only helps if you have at least see two to five years of work experience, right? Uh, without that, you don't really appreciate what goes on in a master's or MBA program. So my view is, I mean, get some experience and then do an MBA and, uh, and then move on and do investment banking or whatever, right? That that would be one experience. My words of advice to you. Yeah. So one last question, uh, and we can sure. close off the session. So uh, this is an interesting question, actually. Does uh, CFA facilitate a career in private equity? Oh, good one. Okay. That's a very interesting question. Does CFA facilitate career in private equity? Uh, so CFA is what you call a buy side qualification in a way, right? As in, you can, well, you can work on the buy side or you can work on the sell side, right? Sell side is brokerage, buy and investment banking. Buy side is mutual funds, private equity funds. So yes, uh, it does help because it is, you're looking at you're valuing investments, you're analyzing investments. However, private equity as a asset class is not that deeply covered in CFA. Uh, it's so CFA is a massive, like, no, you can think of CFA as a mother qualification with lots of uh, specializations, but mainly focusing on portfolio management. Private equity is what you call an alternative asset class. And alternative investments are not covered in depth in CFA. 
There's a qualification called Kaya, Chartered Alternative Investment Analyst. It's a, it's a global qualification. That's probably more apt for native investments, although nowhere as well respected or as popular as the CFA. But yeah, uh, private equity and CFA does make sense, um, definitely. Okay, uh, thanks a lot to all the questions. And we have got a lot of questions on uh, CFA, on CFA to CPA together, and ACCA, MBA, and all that. So as I mentioned that we are bringing on uh, ACCA, uh, people who are doing something in the ACCA industry and uh, MBAs uh, along with their CPA and CFAs. So we'll be doing that in the uh, near future in uh, FIC itself. We have lined up uh, the uh, corporates and uh, industry experts in that. So thanks a lot, Vinod sir. Uh, thanks from my side. and. Uh, I would like to give it back to the MCs. Yeah, just one request before a handover. Could you, sir, yes, could someone share my LinkedIn address with the audience, please? So okay. that um, they can reach out to me if they have any queries and happy to answer any queries on CA or CFA or finance careers. Um, yes, sir. We will be, uh, sir. Uh, we'll be sharing your presentation also sure. uh, with uh, okay. the uh, link too. So, is there anything else, sir? Uh, which... uh, actually, not. Thank you so much once again, and uh, yeah, look forward to great prospects at FIC. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, we are indeed honored to have you amongst us today. I'm sure all of us will definitely take them into our future financial endeavors. Thanks, Ray.